We have a second panel here for you today. And in addition to Brent and Carrie and Newton, I'd like to introduce Stefan Labulio, who's the Director of Corrections and Reentry with the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Um, so I'm going to say just a few opening remarks around our second topic and then uh, ask a few questions of our panel. Um, and so the first, um, you know, we had mentioned to you before that there's a strong research base for most of the areas of work that we looked into in our report. We will be sending out a copy of our final report to everyone who attended this event today, so you will receive it. And you'll see a summary of the guiding literature um, behind any of these services that we're talking about. And um, through in, in the area of justice, there really has been a long history since really 1990 of focusing on assessment as a critical component of um, services in reentry as well as in working with any justice involved population. And um, the Council of State Governments, uh, where, where Stefan works, created an integrated assessment service matching approach that he'll talk a little bit about today. So I wanted to introduce it to you. Um, but it sim you know, in its most simple terms, it's a recommendation that um, faith and community-based organizations work with uh, the justice groups that they're involved with, the prisons or, or, re or, um, or halfway houses, um, to be able to get assessment data and identify whether individuals could be considered low risk for recidivism or high risk for recidivism, and, and identify their level of readiness for employment, so more ready versus less ready. And so they recommend putting individuals kind of into one of these four categories and then, and then providing services that align with that assessment. Um, and so there's, again, a, a long history of research that shows that um, assessing not just employment readiness but also risk of recidivism uh, is an important component of this work. Um, in our report, we identify some of the individual risk factors as well as resiliency factors that we found high-performing organizations assessing. And so this diagram, although complex, is in the final report and we'll certainly share it with you. But it identifies some of the areas that you've heard our participants speak about. You know, it's important that programs understand some of the basic external risk factors or basic needs that participants might have regarding housing, regarding food, in food uh, insecurity, transportation barriers, childcare. Um, but that they look also beyond these risk factors to also focus on those resiliency factors, um, the strengths, the aptitudes, the interests that individuals have, the family support that they may have as well, um, and try to cultivate and build on those assets um, through their participation in the program. So I'm going to turn to our panel, and, and Stefan, I'm going to actually ask you to start, if you wouldn't mind. I'd love to hear a bit about um, how and why the CSG Justice Center developed this tool that we were just looking at, the Integrated Reentry and Employment Strategy. What issues or challenges were you seeing in the field that you were responding to? Great. Thank you. Uh, so pleased to be here today and representing the Council of State Governments Justice Center and the National Reentry Resource Center, which is a project funded by the Bureau of Justice Assistance. And it is the NRRC that helped develop the integrated reentry and employment uh, framework. Uh, I joined uh, 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 CSG after 23 years of running and managing correctional facilities where we provided pre release and reentry services. So I'm really pleased to be able to talk about the work that we have done in this particular area. On assessment, we recognized a gulf in knowledge and in practice between corrections and between those who are providing employment services. Mm -hmm. If you asked your uh, probation and parole officer, what were your, what's your mission? What's your focus? It is on maintaining public safety right. and reducing recidivism. And then if you asked your employment service provider, what is your mission? It is getting a person a job helping them get as high a wage as they can and hoping that they can keep that job and supporting that in the, uh, uh, in, in the process. Uh, in the conversation with employers, the term recidivism, which is a pretty hard word to pronounce, was, was usually not something that they w really considered. And on the correctional side, it didn't really matter what job an individual got, just any job that would meet the, the requirements of, of conditional supervision. So in, in a certain sense, what the framework does is help create a common language, make both the employment side and the correction side um, uh, bilingual, recognizing that employment and corrections should be perfectly aligned in, in goals of maintaining public safety and reducing uh, recidivism. Um, 
how we went about accomplishing this, we asked some frontline staff individuals from organizations. We reached over and, and created partnerships between the Department of Labor, and again, we were representing the, uh, the Justice Department, and we sat down and talked about how do we take the risk assessment information that is so important in the research basis of correctional reentry programs and marry that with the job readiness program. You know, as, as, as Brent mentioned, we've been lucky in, in this country in that President Bush signed the Second Chance Act in 2008. As Brent Cohen talked about, we've put $400 million into the field. President Obama has been a staunch supporter and has continued uh, this effort. The Department of Labor has put in hundreds of millions of dollars. We have learned a lot about what works. And the mission of the National Reentry Resource Center is to bring the evidence to bear. We want people who care. Uh, we like well intentions. We like effectiveness and results even more. Mm -hmm. And we have learned in the body of research that good intentions is not enough. And what the integrated reentry framework has done is brought the evidence to bear to make programs more effective. Thank you so much, Stefan. So, Newton, when we visited your program in South Florida, we had the privilege of seeing your staff actually use uh, these categories that we had mentioned. I'll actually pull it up on the slide so you can see. We actually saw them um, assign numbers uh, the, to these categories, to the individuals they were assessing, which was interesting. Tell me more about how that works at your organization. How are you using these categories and this kind of approach uh, in your assessment and case management process? First of all, you, Stefan, nailed it. I think that we've always observed that there's a role, and we, and we respect that role, and we acknowledge that role, that the job of you know, justice institutions, uh, corrections institutions, are to provide safety, to maintain control, et cetera. And, there's our, and therein lies our value proposition to uplift the folks, provide assessment tools to subsequently provide coordinated case management, job placement support, et cetera, et cetera. But again, you can't prescribe the same uh, antidote for every person. So it is important to engage that individual where they are. You know, all of the folks that we engage have an aspiration to do better with their lives. And I got to steal a line from our former, our, 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 pre, our, our founder, Reverend Leon Sullivan. He would always say that aspiration without preparation leads to frustration. Mm -hmm. Frustration of economies, frustration of communities when people try to give back. So the way you mitigate those frustrations and by doing evidence-based assessments to get a gauge on who it is that you're dealing with. Now, again, there's an inherent opportunity to engage to show a sense of genuine care uh, uh, backed and aligned with evidence and science to make sure that you're assessing what is going on with this individual. There's also a trauma-informed care element to it. There's a lot of trauma happening in a lot of our communities throughout the country, and these, these steps, steps help mitigate and engage with a trauma-informed mindset to make sure that we understand that if such and such has a, has a problem, we're dealing with their individual problem and using that to inform an individualized and specific case management plan for them to be successful. Thank you. And Carrie, I actually would love for you to talk a bit about more about trauma-informed care. Um, you know, what, how is your organization starting to apply some of those principles, and why is it important for your organization to take a trauma-informed approach? It's, it's very important. We learned, uh, and you know, we work with both adult as well as juvenile offenders, um, and what we learned was despite the elevated risk of each of our participants is that they all were experiencing trauma. Um, even though they may have been the perpetrators of causing trauma to other people, they too had experienced trauma. It just depends on the individual. You know, a lot of our juveniles, when they come, a lot of them have experienced the trauma of being homeless, of being victims of crime themselves from family members as well as their community members. Uh, but serving time, like um, incarceration, is one of the highest risk of trauma that a person can exist through. And so we learned that even though we are a, an agency of compassion, and we believe in treating everybody with dignity and respect, we understood that we needed to step back and look at which type of trauma our participants actually had um, you know, existed through and lived through and determine how do we incorporate that into our day-to-day -day prescription of services as well as compassion. And then once we learned uh, exactly what trauma is, um, we also began to learn how to deal and how to communicate differently with our participants about the effects of trauma, despite 
the trauma that they experienced. Um, but it helps us to better prepare prepare for case management, how we deliver case management, and, and our motivational interviewing techniques that we do. We are able now to establish relationships quicker. Mm -hmm. uh, we are also asking questions differently, like as opposed to asking somebody, um, you know, why, we're asking what happened. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's just the way of how you manage your, your process or the person through their trauma. Because once you can get them to ideal, uh, actually express, because that's part of the problem. Once you can get them to express actually what happened to them, then we can get, we have a breakthrough mm -hmm. and we can actually start providing real services to address the core cause of why they were incarcerated in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, and how do we get them from that mindset to the next mindset? And the whole idea is to make sure that everybody leaves a success. Um, so you have to get people to identify what their trauma is. Mm -hmm. And some oftentimes African Americans don't like to even use terminology as trauma or uh, I mental, you know, I, I, you, if you mention mental health, you know, oftentimes we say, we think that you're saying that we're crazy. Mm -hmm. We're not, mm -hmm. we're not, mm -hmm. but we are all existing through some type of trauma. So how do you help me get from point A to point Z? And that's why we took that approach. Um, we incorporated motivational interviewing techniques mm -hmm. along with the trauma-informed care approach. Mm -hmm. And it is truly a remarkable difference and has made a difference in the way uh, our outcomes. It has. Thank you so much, Carrie. So uh, Brent, I'd love to hear from you from your kind of bigger picture perspective and experience providing training and technical assistance to organizations similar to Newton and Carrie's. What recommendations or thoughts do you have about resources or information that would be most useful to faith and community-based organizations as they seek to become more trauma-informed or as they seek to use more evidence-based instruments for their assessments? I think it's an incredibly important topic and we're seeing this across all types of, of human services programs. You know, the need for providers of human services to be more trauma-informed uh, it's hard to turn everybody into a cognitive behavioral therapist, which is kind of what, you know, ultimately where people need to head if they're going to overcome the effects of their trauma. Mm -hmm. It is uh, substantially easier to build a more empathetic um, service delivery system just by raising the level of awareness and education mm -hmm. about the existence of trauma. And that's really where we are largely in the system is just kind of at the front edge, although the research has been now going on for decades, it's now getting to the point where we can begin to educate our delivery systems about what trauma is, how it manifests. Um, the person that you're dealing with is not being stubborn and recalcitrant, refusing to come to, to appointments, um, uh, engaging in counterproductive and antisocial behavior. They, they have just uh, been severely affected by early trauma. Frequently, this, these things occur when people are very young, um, and that it damages the ability later in life to manage relationships. Mm -hmm. So just trying to get that information into the system so that we have case managers who have heard of, what, have heard of trauma, who have heard of toxic stress, who have heard of executive function deficits that can help them look at the person that they're dealing with a little bit differently. Now, in terms of the resources that are available, there's tons, there's gonna to be tons more. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you go to um, say something like the Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouse, mm -hmm. um, which our company operates on behalf of HHS, um, SAMHSA um, has tremendous resources, mm -hmm. Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, tremendous resources on trauma, toxic stress, executive function. There's a lot out there that's available that needs to be packaged in a way that makes it accessible to frontline workers and organizations that are doing that frontline work with um, people coming home from prison. Excellent. Thank you so much. I want to thank our panelists. Thank you so much for being with us and for sharing your perspective. Thank you.